say for a, a minute or less than a minute, um, I'm Randy Brockman, and it's been my pleasure to be working with Michelle now for almost a year um, and uh, bringing uh, different programs to you. Um, I work with Home Watch Caregivers, which is a home health agency in Essex, Union, Passaic, and Morris counties. And we have now about 128 caregivers out in the field helping people post-surgery or, uh, or people who need more care in their homes with uh, activities of daily living, companionship. Um, it's a trying time for families who can't see their family uh, members. Uh, so the, you know, there, are, there are some choices to have fewer people coming into the home and there are some choices uh, to have to have an aide come into the home on a regular basis to make sure that everybody is safe and sound. Um, happy to be here with you. And today's program is with, um, with Robert Mays, who is a wonderful colleague of mine. And um, one second, I just want to, uh, just want to get out of this for a second. So um, Robert Mays is the, um, one second, where is my screen? My screen disappeared. Sorry, this zo the Zoom uh, made Zoom something audio. disappear. So, so you um, got to do hello? one video to get Zoom audio. Well, so hello? probably it, it didn't start is, yet. What is, oh, we have somebody else on. Hello? Somebody wasn't muted, but I muted them. Oh, okay. So, um, one second. So, Robert Mays is the community liaison and marketing coordinator for the Jewish Community Housing Corporation, um, and they are a um, an organization that has uh, four senior properties uh, for living, residential living, and they serve different purposes. The first property is Village Apartments in South Orange. They're for independent living. Um, they're right in the center of a lovely town. South Orange is very similar to Montclair. Um, so there's a train station and there are lots of restaurants and stores. And right now things are a little bit different than they were a year ago, but we're hoping that we'll all get back to um, that lively life that both Montclair and South Orange provide. Um, another is the B'nai B'rith building, which is um, housing, which is uh, for people who have limited income, and uh, but it provides uh, wonderful uh, apartment living for independent living. There's Lester Senior Living Residence, which is located in Whippany, and they have both assisted living and independent living uh, buildings um, in beautiful facility. And uh, Mr. Mays is responsible for going out to the community and speaking to potential residents about all the wonderful things that the JCHC has um, in, in, uh, for their residents and the care that's provided to have peace of mind. And he oversees all the marketing programs and I've had the pleasure of working with him now for about a year. Um, and he's gonna be presenting to you one of these topics, uh, which is probably dear to all of us, chocolate. So I'm gonna let Robert take over um, with the art of chocolate. Well, thank you, Randy. Thank you for Michelle for having me today. The art of chocolate presented by myself, Robert Mays. And this is all about chocolate and how chocolate has shaped the world and has changed our lives. And who would think that something that sweet would be able to touch so many people in the world? So we're gonna start. The art of chocolate. That there, sorry. The art of chocolate. The Chocolate Tale Workshop is an animated, interactive, and participatory seminar in which seniors will learn about chocolate, how about how chocolate has played a role in the history of the world. As you can see, the Hershey Kisses, I think we've all had Hershey Kisses as some form of our life and love the taste of Hershey Kisses. The history. The first people known to have made chocolate were the ancient culture of Mexico and Central America. These people, including the Maya and Aztecs, mixed a ground coca seed with various seasonings to make a spicy, froth, frothy, drink. And as you can see, the picture at the bottom is what coca looks like, what chocolate is made from, and how it grows off the side of a tree. All right, as you can see, drinking chocolate was an important part of Maya and Aztec life. 
As you can see the top, we have a picture for illustration purposes of what it looked like when they were carrying some of these things. Many people in classic periods, period Maya society, could drink chocolate at least on occasions, although it was although it was a particular a particularly favorite beverage for royalty. But in Aztec society, primarily rulers, priests, decorated soldiers, and honored merchants could partake in this sacred brew. How chocolate conquered one second, the world. One second, Robert. We yes. had a comment from, um, okay. we had a comment that uh, Barbara couldn't see, can't see the screen. Barbara, have you been able to? No, mine just says Robert has started screen sharing, but I can't seem to get, see it. So maybe up at the top, okay. uh, it, it says view options. Do you see that, Barbara? I'm looking, yes. No, you... oh, no. Bar Barbara has to look on hers. She, she can't see it. Um, if no. you if you see view options at the top, share screen. It says no. you are viewing Robert's Robert's screen, and yes. then next to that is view options. If you put side by side mode, you should be able to see. Oh, it. okay, okay, thank you. Randy, no can you see it? I see it fine. Does everybody Good. else see it? I I imagine they would say Sorry. it if they did it. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Do we have any other problems? If anyone can just put it in the chat, Randy will slow me down so that we can stop and fix any technical problems that we have. How chocolate conquered the world. Later, the Spanish conquistadors brought the seeds back home to Spain where new recipes were created. And as you can see, the Aztecs had wars with the Spanish and a lot of this was over chocolate. A lot of people did not know this with history, that a lot of this was over chocolate because as Spain tried to go out into the world and find riches as the other countries of Europe was doing, in their process of trying to find riches, they found chocolate. Isn't that mm -hmm. something? <laughs> chocolate is a major hit. Until the 1500s, no one in Europe knew anything about the delicious drink that would later become a huge world hit. Spain's search for a route to the riches led its explorers to the Americas and introduced them to the chocolate delicious flavor. Eventually, the Spanish conquered chocolate back home, where it quickly became a court favorite and within a hundred years, the love of chocolate spread throughout the rest of Europe. So as we see, as life started to begin to culture out more, and as other countries were looking for riches in gold, some were able to find other things that were the equivalent of gold at the time. Because chocolate was so desired, it may have been just as valuable as gold was. Was just it like a little the spices? Was it like spice, like the spice trade it was, also, right? It was exactly like the spice trade because when things are rare, they become more valuable. As I was always taught in college, supply and demand dictates price. So as we know that, we understand that the less supply you have of chocolate made it more valuable because only the Spanish conquistadors could bring it back from the Americas. The 1600s, the bakers in Bayonne, many of them Portuguese Jews, would bake souffle like cake rolls, which were light as air. And in Italy, Jewish bakers invented chocolate cakes known as tortas or tortes, using ground nuts instead of flour. And as you can see on the bottom, this is what some of that looks like or had looked like. Chocolate history. For hundreds of years, the chocolate making process remained relatively unaltered. By the, by the mid 1700s, the blossoming industrial revolution saw the emergence of innovations that changed the future of chocolate. Harvesting. Coca harvesting is done by hand. Unlike many contemporary crops, coca cannot be harvested by machines. Each thick pod growing from growing off the trunk and branches of the coca tree must be plucked by hand. And as you can see, 
I have an illustration of what a coca plant looks like once it's burst open so that you can see. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever tasted raw chocolate, but I want to tell you, it doesn't taste very good. I know because my mother makes chocolate cakes every year for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And for a joke, she gave me a piece of chocolate that had no sugar in it. I was unaware of that. And it was very funny how I did not like it. And she was telling me what chocolate was really made of and use it as a teaching moment. So I would like to illustrate to you guys, chocolate does not taste well until it's processed and manufactured down to the taste that we're so used to tasting with that sugar. Here are some illustrations of what chocolate in action looks like. As you can see, once you burst open a chocolate, the seed, it's, it's, it's really a big pod. And once you burst it open, you have a lot of little seeds in there. Those seeds are taken and then ground into a powdery mix. That powdery mix is then taken, added water to it, and then it's given another process where now it's created into that film and that, that spread that we're so used to. And the only reason I know this is because watching my mother bake cakes and her doing it from hand and knowing the recipe that was passed down to her using raw chocolate to do that. And once she does that, she has to do that, spread it down, and she has to make sure it's even, and then she has to add sugar to it. And once she adds that sugar to it, the thing that I liked as a little kid, as the helper, I got to lick the bowl when she was done. <laughs> That's the only thing I got to do because it was too sweet that if we ate too much of it, our stomachs would be sick, as I think a lot of you already know that you probably remember the treat of licking the bowl after someone was done making cakes, if you had that privilege. Next slide. Chocolate in action. Making chocolate takes years of labor, of, takes years of manual labor. Like most agricultural crops, coca must be closely monitored by farmers. They regularly walk their fields and check for pests, mold, and disease that, would, that can possibly wipe out a whole crop. At the bottom, I showed you what some of those plants look like as they come off and how a farmer must look at his crop the same way someone looks at their coffee crop or any other agricultural crop because it's very important. And a lot of them, this is how they make their living. And if you make your living doing something, you want to make sure that you keep your crop and things in good order so that they're able to be purchased at market. The Industrial Age. In 1879, Rudolf Lindt created another important device, the Kunk machine. As you can see, it's called that because the earliest machine resembled a conch shell. And I think a lot of us know what a conch shell looks like, and this is what they named the machine after. after. It churns and pastes made from coca seeds into a smooth blend, perfect for rich, creamy chocolate bars. So as you can see, as time started to go on, just as time has gone on now, new inventions made it possible to really refine coca seeds into a powder and then to turn that powder into a mix. Because in the 1600s and the 1500s, they were using it to make a drink out of it. Because added to water, it will create a frothy mix that you can add sugar or some type of spice to that will make it delicious to taste. But to make it into those little bars and candies that we eat, it has to first be processed down smoothened out and then reheated back up to form a mold into the different type of candy bars. And depending on what sugars and recipes they added would change the taste. Because as you know, a Milky Way bar, a Snickers, a Three Musketeers, a Twix, they all taste different, but they're all chocolate. So that's just some of the things I would like to share with you. Manufacturing. This third stage in turning coca into chocolate takes place on the factory floor. Once the manufacturers receive a shipment of seeds, they quickly begin to length, they quickly begin the lengthy task of processing the coca into chocolate. Through this process, coca seeds are transformed into chocolate and other coca products. So as you can see on the bottom, I have something to show you the illustration of when the machine is working and how that machine keeps blending it around as a blender would do when you're making cakes 
to create that mix of the frothiness of the chocolate and getting it to be creamy. And then once you have that done, they have to take that out and then lay it on something to smooth it out and then have that smoothened down before they reheat it back up, as I said before, to make it into bars. All right, some more history for you guys. As you can see, in the 1920s, Good Humor Bar is created by Harry Burt in Youngstown, Ohio. The Baby Ruth, which some of you guys may be able to remember, is created by Curtis Candy Company of Chicago. It was named after President Cleveland's daughter. How many people know that fact? That was something nice that I found that I didn't know, and I love Baby Ruth myself. 1921, Peter Paul Company creates the Almond Bar from a formula created by a chemist, George Shingle. 1923, the Butterfinger is introduced. The creation of Curtis Candy Company of Chicago as a publicity stunt. Otis Scherning, the creator of the candy bar, drops Butterfingers and baby roofs from airplanes over 40 cities, pushing the popularity of both treats to new heights. <laughs> Frank C. Mars develops the Milky Way candy bar in Minnesota, St. Paul. One year later, sales of the new candy go from $72,800 to $792,000. Now, we can understand back in 1923, $792,000 is millions of dollars today. So it shows how much chocolate has grown has become something that everyone loves and that has basically a taste that all of us cannot deny that we all have had at some point in our life. Whether you liked it or didn't like it, you've had tasted some chocolate. And I think we've all tasted some chocolate that we did like. As you can see, some of you guys may remember this, the illustrations of some of the marketing that was done for the baby roof. Isn't that something? Wow. If we could all go back in time in a time capsule and see some of the things from long, long ago that still give us purpose of where we begin. Because if you don't know where you've been, you can't know where you're going. Mass production. New machinery of industrial age made it possible to create solid chocolate and mass produce this candy in enormous quantities at a fraction of the original cost. For the first time, most of the general public could afford this tasty treat. So now they made it as things got better, they came up with better processes that could create the candy at such an effective cost that now everyone could have it because they could lower the price cheap enough that everyone even who didn't make enough money could now taste this delicious treat. So this is another reason why chocolate was able to rule the world. Kind of like cell phones are today. I kind of remember when there were no cell phones, which I know you guys do. And to see how cell phones now are in everyone's pocket, I still remember being able to go to the corner and put a dime or a nickel in the phone and be able to make a phone call. Nowadays, that is unthinkable. Everyone has a cell phone. If you don't have a cell phone, someone's wondering what's wrong. So this is something that I can compare that to that some of you would be able to relate to. I don't think so. I think all of you guys would be able to relate to it because I can. Some poetry in motion. Some things to know and some quick quotes that you guys may remember from those times. Enjoying this whenever it's suitable, whatever it suits your mood. Not as a drink, but as a much-loved food. So some people didn't look at chocolate as a dessert. They looked at it as a food something that they really, really enjoy to eat, and they enjoy the feeling of when they ate it. Because I think we've all had a moment where we taste some chocolate, and you can remember what you were thinking at that specific time in your life or at that specific time of things going on. And I have several moments, especially holiday times, because it seems like holiday times is when everyone's pushing candy on everyone, and everyone has a, a bowl dish on the coffee table with chocolates in it, and if nothing comes out in time with the food, everyone has had a piece of chocolate to try not to spoil the meal. All right. A note written by German poet John Wolf Wolfgang von Gilt 
1820 to accompany a box of chocolates, probably to a sweetheart. Some more poetry. Eat it in secret. The richness buzzes your brain. Chocolate, my high. Wow. Deep luxury. Dark chocolate. My, oh my. Now my heart can fly. I like that. <laughs> chocolate is your heart to sing. Yes, it is wicked. And it is so bad to do. Chocolate, sheesh, my vice. And just to let you know, we all have vices and I love chocolate too. Well, because we're talking about all these great things chocolate is, we also have to remember chocolate does have a downside. Because we mainly eat it as a candy with sugar added, it's going to be high in calories and not necessarily good for you in Robert, high quantities. Robert, Robert, foods. So in my sometimes Robert, is not matching. Yeah, Robert, your your um your internet is uh, in and out. I'm so, in and out. Yeah. I'm okay. so sorry. Would you like me to start over? I will start it over. The downside of chocolate, because we mainly eat it as a candy with sugar added, it's going to be high in calories and not necessarily good for you in high quantity because it will take the place of more nutrition foods. So in my expectations, you have to remember, everything has to be taken in moderation and it's not to be overindulged in. So if you eat candy in moderation, I don't think it would be too bad. But if you have candy every day and you're not supplementing and eating other nutrition foods, it's not going to be good for you. And it could cause a lot of wrongful things to happen other than some of the positive. Coca is one of the most addictive substances known. Because chocolate is so good and it does something when we eat it, as I've learned from medical studies, it releases some endorphins in our brains that makes it a feeling that we get every time we eat it, that we remember it. And because we remember it, we really like to taste it because we always want that feeling again. And once you taste chocolate, I don't know if you guys have ever given it to a little kid. Every time you pull something out of your pocket, they think it's chocolate. So it does show you how chocolate is well loved by all from young to old to middle. So we all love chocolate. Nestle has shut down a production line after a positive salmonella test on a batch of chocolate morsels as, it, as it's one of its factories in the U.S. for the second time this year. So is that, just is a, that this year? Is that really this year? It year. wasn't this year, but I think it was the year before. In 2019, 2018. Okay, we don't, we don't want to say bad things about Nestle. No, no, no. <laughs> we don't want to say bad things about that. But that's just one of the things that happened. No animal in nature will eat it unless tricked into with milk or water. If you can convince an animal to eat it, then it greatly shortens their lifespan if it does not kill them immediately. Because of the sugar and everything that's in the candy, which makes it delicious to us, is bad for an animal because their intestines is only nine feet, we have 25 feet. So the things that we eat and can consume, our body has the ability to break that down, whereas an animal doesn't. And the reason I know this is because I have a dog and the vet has always told me when feeding my dog how to properly do that and not to give it excessive sugar. So excessive sugar to an animal can give them diabetes or things that can be very harmful to them. So and everything so has to and chocolate, I think, is, is poisonous to dogs, specifically. I would think so. I would think so. That's why they're not allowed to even have it. You shouldn't even leave it around. Next slide. So as I said, I always like to start off with the bad, because it, once you understand that, but there is a lot of good that comes with chocolate. Some of the benef health benefits of chocolate is dark chocolate may also have anti-cancerous benefits, because flavonoids may help reduce the cell damage that can spur tumor growth. This is a nutritionist from German Institute had posted this. John Hopkins, dark chocolate guards against brain industry from stroke. Chocolate consumption may lower blood pressure, help prevent formations of 
artery artery platelets and improve right. blood flow, according to other research, CNN. Reduces blood pressure in the livers because of the antioxidants. Also, some more fun history that you guys may remember. America falls in love with chocolate. 1892, the Hershey Company is founded by Milton Hershey. He already has a Carmel business and considers this new venture only a side, a, a, a side venture. As we know, Hershey Company became very huge and it became the primary part of his business, the chocolate, and then he started to infuse Carmel into chocolate. 1900s, this year, the first milk chocolate Hershey bar was produced. Another fun fact. 1903, 13 miles from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in a small town called Derry Church, Milton Hershey built a chocolate factory. On Chocolate Ave and Coca Ave are two new streets in the little town, which will soon be renamed Hershey, Pennsylvania. Another fun fact, before Hershey, Pennsylvania was renamed Hershey, Pennsylvania, it was Derry Church, Pennsylvania. In 1912, Whitman Sampler introduced to the public the Sampler Box includes a collection of popular pieces of chocolate candy, uh, chocolate sold in the confectionery shops. Here is some advertisements you guys may remember from those times of the 1920s. And as you can see, some of the artwork and things of those days. And I remember a box of Whitman samplers in my house as a little kid. I've seen that box before. Isn't that they've, ma they've maintained that box. It's a traditional yes, they did. box. Yeah. I remember seeing that. Wow. Takes me down memory lane. Mm -hmm. Lots of steps to getting to that Hershey kiss. It goes through a process of cleaning. They must clean the seeds before they start anything else. So once the seed is taken off the tree and it is cracked open and the little seeds are taken out, all of those little seeds, just like black eyed peas or any of the women here that cook or cooks here, they have to clean it. So once they clean the seeds, the seeds are then cleaned and then they're roasted. Once they're roasted and softened up, they're cracked. Once they're cracked, that the inner shell of that crack, just like you would do a peanut, is then grinded up. That grinding up of that powdery mix is pressed and mixed, as we said before, and then that is refined. That is refined, sugar is added to it, and then it's placed in a mold. Once it's placed in that mold, it's heated up, and that's how we get a candy bar or a Hershey Kiss, either way. But they're, they're, that is the process that it must go through before we eventually get the finished product that we so love to put into our mouth. Godiva Chocolatiers, some of you may remember this. Godiva Chocolatiers was founded 80 years ago, 80 years ago in Brussels, Belgium, where master chocolatier Joseph Drapes founded a chocolate company that, would, that was named in honor of the legend of Lady Godiva. Lady Godiva was actually a tax protester in England. What a beautiful advertisement, though. Hanukkah guilt. How many of you guys remember this? Now, I remember getting these, the chocolate that looks like money. And when you take it and you open it, you have to open it from the side because it actually looks like gold coins. So I'm assuming that a lot of you know what this is and remember Hanukkah guilt. And a lot of people remember keeping these because I remember my grandparents giving them to me all the time. And it's something sweet that they had and something that I always looked forward to when I met them or saw one of them, that they would definitely give me one of these. Meet Tea's Chocolatiers. Jim Kellogg loves being a cowboy. He works on an Angus beef ranch 30 miles outside of Cody, Wyoming, and rides saddle broncos on the rodeo circuit. 
but he loves chocolate. He still wears his boots and cowboy chaps. Now he just switches out his chaps and saddle for an iron and a kitchen, for an apron and a kitchen and a, and a mixer. Well, chocolate's a business. In 1925, New York Stock Exchange added Coca Exchange and created by merchants, importers, and brokers. 1930, Mars Incorporated creates the Snickers Bar. How many of you remember that? Mars Incorporate Mars Incorporation introduces the Three Musketeers bars. It sells for a nickel. 1940, a candy-coated chocolate is created especially for the United States military by Forrest Mars and Bruce Mary at Mars Incorporated. Their initials led to the name M&M. &M. Another fun fact. 1947, Peter Paul introduces the Almond Joy Bar as a companion to the Almonds Bar. 19, in 2020, Coca, Coca futures have been trading at three-year highs with prices rallying since the beginning of the year. Mysterious traders buy all of Europe Coca. It will move the entire global market. Not one is sure who did this stock purchase. Hedge funds may be attempting to corner the chocolate market. Now, who would have thought that? Something to think about, some advertisements from the 1940s compared to advertisements of the 2020s. If you look, look how far chocolate has come in all of these years. Eminem hasn't changed much with the look, but just gave it all a new makeover. That, that advertisement on the right is, uh, is an advertisement uh, it, it's an advertisement for a store that is totally dedicated to M&Ms, the entire store on Broadway. Wow. So now I'm going to open the floor up for any questions that you guys may have or anything about chocolate that you guys would like to talk about or any stories that I know some of you guys may have about chocolate that you can share with us. Can we open the floor up for that, Randy? Sure. Hi, my name's Carol. Hello, Carol. And a couple of years ago, um, I was flying over to Europe, and the man sitting next to me was one of the five men, or five people in the world that actually is a chocolate. He goes around and they sell, they get the chocolate and sell it to the different companies. There's only five people in the whole world that do that, and they meet once a year every spring. Wow, that's amazing to me. That so, was a very amazing one. When he told me that, I said, what do you do? And he goes, we, we go to the different people that, that, make, that grow the chocolate, and right. then we buy it from them and sell it. So wow. they buy up all of, basically, they buy up all of the consumption of chocolate globally, and then they resell it to the markets. Correct. Yeah. Only so five people. We have, we have a question. How is white chocolate made? That's a great question. I didn't study that one. But I would assume it's the same way. But I, it, it, you're frozen, Robert. That's interesting because when I saw, try again. Oh, I said when I saw coca coca paste made, it was already the same color. It was already black to brown, so it was already that color. I've never seen white chocolate made. So I would assume that it is chocolate, and I don't know if they add color to it to make it white, but I'm assuming that's what it would be, because how else would it be chocolate? I've never seen a chocolate seed white. I've always seen them dark. I hope, I don't, I hope that answers your question. I think that they add color to it. I'm not I think, sure. I think what I understand is that there's just um, more milk solids in it, so it's, oh. it's, um, and more sugar. Um, and that's why it, it, it's more white. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, yeah, it's, it's cocoa butter. It's cocoa butter, um, at, like Randy said, cocoa butter, milk solids, sugar, and sometimes vanilla. Um, mm -hmm. Some people do not like white chocolate. <laughs> um, 
But well, it's not, yeah, it has a little different taste. I, I think a little white chocolate drizzled on real chocolate, to me, dark chocolate is real chocolate, is perfectly acceptable. Love dark chocolate. <laughs> Love dark chocolate. Yeah, Sharon said Sharon um, said that um, white chocolate, milk, cocoa butter, lecithin, milk fat. So it's the it's the milk solids that make it white. That makes it white. Okay. Hope that answers your question. You had yeah. another question here from Jean, who asked, "Is uh, cacao grown today anywhere besides Mexico?" My knowledge is grown in Mexico and South America. I don't know anywhere else that produces the soil they could grow it with the, also the weather. Because we also have to remember that the weather conditions and the soil have to be a certain mixture so that the seed would have the right nutrients to grow. So I'm not quite sure if it, it would grow anywhere else in the world if that mix is not the same. Any other questions? Or anyone want to share another story? Yeah, now I, I want to eat some, now I want to go eat some chocolate. <laughs> there you go. And if we was together, I would have brought different chocolates with yeah. me. Was and I would like intent? to send them out to you guys if we could. <laughs> so, Michelle, if we could, uh, Randy and I would like to send the chocolates out to your seniors. Oh, or if wow. we could drop them off to you and you can send them out either way. Okay. I, I will. Are you for real? Are we really going to get chocolate? Wait. Well, that's something we're trying to do. All right. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm doing pickups next week, so people are going to be picking up their art packs and their 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 books for their book club, and people want to swing by. Um, and then anybody else, I I have um, I think 22, 21, 22 people um on the call. So I um. I can anybody that can't that doesn't drive or doesn't can't get out. I can um, possibly send out or do a drop off. So, um, but I great. can't take any responsibility though if you don't pick it up that it may get eaten by yeah, Michelle. will have some nice chocolate snacks there. <laughs> yes, she will. No, no, yes, no, no. she will. No, no, no. I, I, definitely what I was talking about. We wanted to do. Okay, um, great. But we, could, we could definitely arrange that. Um, I have um, a list of uh, all of you based because we have this great database now. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody out there has like a family tradition of chocolate, uh, like that a family tradition that revolves around chocolate. But in my family, the tradition, the chocolate tradition is um, when I was growing up at every single Thanksgiving and every single Christmas Eve, gathering my aunt my great aunt would bring a box of Dayton chocolates um they were chocolate covered crackers they looked like saltines but in the shape of a little cigar and they would be um draped with um like you know di dipped in chocolate so it was like that salty like a pretzel like a chocolate covered oh, great and they came in milk chocolate and dark chocolate they were hand dipped and she'd bring a box of those and then we would literally devour them and my father would grumble that we didn't leave him any leftover, you know, but, but we, yeah, we but literally loved them. On my aunt's deathbed, my great aunt was, um, was very sick and she was dying. And she handed me a hundred dollar bill and she said, I, for as long as you can, I want you to buy at every Christmas and Thanksgiving, I want you to buy Dayton chocolates or whatever, chocolate cover crackers and um, just here's the money. And she wasn't really dying. She was just sick. And she got <laughs> her and I had the hundred bucks and she never said anything about it. Well, I didn't think about it. She, about five or six years later, she passed away and Thanksgiving came and somebody, you know, people were saying, Oh, it's not going to be the same this year without, uh, without Auntie Annie. And I, and it clicked in my head and I, and I went to the, the chocolate store and was closed. They had moved. Oh, yeah. I found it. I bought the chocolates and I put them on the table and everybody started crying. And I said, Auntie Annie. And so every year since then, I just, I just got them again um, for, for Thanksgiving. It's just what we do. We have to, we, no meal is complete without a cigar of, you know, a chocolate, little oh, yeah. chocolate cracker. That's crackers. an amazing story. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So I show it's going to run out because the price keeps going up. Going up, yeah. <laughs> the price keeps piece, going up. Not cheap anymore. A piece of information about cocoa bean farms. 
Seventy percent of the world cocoa bean farms are in Ghana and the Ivory Coast. Wow! Wow! Not, well, not that's, in South that's America. Africa. Oh. And also, I'm not. I hate to uh, throw poison on the presentation, but right now, before the Supreme Court of the United States, is a case against Nestle's chocolate and one other company, I forgot the name, because both of these companies are well aware that the cocoa bean farms in those parts of the world are actually, har the, the cocoa beans are farmed by enslaved uh, children. Uh. Enslaved children that they, ca they kidnap and they take them to these uh. farms. So it's a terrible situation over there. Wow. Oh my yeah. goodness. Wow. Supreme Court. It's before the Supreme Court right now. Wow. Oh my goodness. That's very informative. I didn't know that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you have to really like find out where your chocolate's being sourced, I guess, just like everything else, coffee beans and chocolate. Yeah. Um, you know, there aren't no local, you know, farmers. You know, there's nothing. Yeah, and they, and, they, and they also said that the majority of cocoa bean farmers are very impoverished. Mm. 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 All the money is in processing the cocoa beans That's into right. candy. Into the mm. candy. And yeah. then sold and resold to all over the world. Yeah. yeah. And, and so those five uh, uh, purveyors who supposedly trade on the market, whatever the chocolate market is in the world. Futures, yeah. This product, they know darn well what's happening in those right. slavery farm mm -hmm. situations with young children. Terrible, terrible. But I'm still going to eat chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. Uh, it's a little complicated, wouldn't you say? Yep. I, I, I also have a story similar to Michelle. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it used to be the tradition, I, I think, even before I was born, that they would give out cigars when, I, when you know, a new baby was born. And, mm -hmm. then, they, and then they developed pink, pink foil wrapped and blue foil wrapped <coughs> cigars um, when babies were born. You know, chocolate got into the, to replace the tobacco. And um, when my daughter was born, I... I uh, found out that you could do your own chocolate bars with information. So this is, oh, let's see, let's see if I can get it. Oh, that's so, fine. This is my oh. daughter. Here oh, she is beautiful. instead of her oh. shape, oh. right? Oh. And, oh, and then is. it said, it said, you know, net weight, and it had seven pounds, nine ounces. Oh. And on the back, and on the back, the vital statistics were when they arrived and the time and the weight and the length and the birthplace. And the ingredients were sugar, spice, and everything nice. And manufactured by me and my husband. <laughs> and it was, you know. Oops. That is cute. Aww. That's beautiful. That's cute. Oh, that and you can so still nice. do that. You can, you can still really contact cute. Hershey's and they'll, they'll do that for you. <laughs> nice. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So she's 24 now, but I still oh. have the chocolate. <laughs> oh. When the chocolate is gone, I still have the wrapper. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many people in your families have um, that one person that takes a bite, doesn't like it, and puts it back? <laughs> I think everyone family has someone, mostly yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah. They take mostly the kids. I don't like that. Put it back. Put it right like, back. Or, or in my family, we have the poker. We have somebody who pokes at them to see. Uh, you know, my, my, I have some relatives that they can't chew and they don't like the, they don't like it. They, they poke the at it. The texture of it. Yeah. I have a little story, a quick story for you. Uh, last time I was in Belgium, you know, Belgium, you, you can go crazy with the chocolates there. The whole, streets full of stores with the chocolates, and they're very expensive. So here I am gathering my chocolate to take home with me. I'm going to bring this as gifts and so on. So everything is fine. Then I get to customs, coming back to the United States. His finger went in every single piece of chocolate. I said, yeah. what, like, what could I be hiding? What kind of explosive could be, <laughs> there be in this little piece Agreed. of chocolate? So I think that's how customs inspectors get their chocolate. <laughs> yeah, and it's expensive. 
Does anybody have any recipes for chocolate? Like I have, my sister makes this orange liqueur and I know orange goes good with chocolate. Mm. So I would like to know if there's some way I can make like a chocolate with like an orange liqueur, like cream filling or something. Mm. Mm. <laughs> That's everybody's assignment. If you let, if you do, <laughs> let me show them. Well, they definitely go well together because like orange, you have, they have the uh, chocolate dipped orange peel, which tastes delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure, but I don't know about how you mix the the cacao with the. Um, although you know they take they take um if you have um, a cup of coffee and they'll put okay. in liqueur you know different kinds mm -hmm. of liqueur into it. So I'm trying maybe to think if maybe melted. I don't know. I was trying to do you like can, a chocolate mold, and then you can make have like an orange cream. You can make truffles, orange truffles. Right. Orange truffles. Fun to do. Oh, okay. Mm. Would be good give, if you had chocolate with that inside. Yeah. <laughs> you took a bite and that came out. <laughs> yeah, you could use the essence, the essence, um, and, and make the truffle and just use the essence of orange. I was going to give you that assignment, Michelle. I was going to no, drop I'm you not, on something. I'm not the chocolatier. I'm not the baker. Uh, I'm really not, but I do, I love all things chocolate and I have so many family history, family lore, um, you know, the Charleston shoe where you put it in the freezer and you break it up. My aunt used to own a, a candy store in Nutley. Oh. Um, it, was a, it wasn't really a candy store, it was, like a, it was an antique store, but um, it was called Lock, Stock and Barrel and she had um, a, a counter with penny candy. So we got, we just all the, the old fashioned candies and um, not really specializing in chocolate, but um, but we also like the, the candy that comes around uh, at Passover. We love the Joya, the, the chocolate, the, uh, chocolate oh, the rings. rings. I love jelly rings. And they also make orange, which was ma made me think of it, Sharon. They make the orange jelly rings. Um, yeah. we, it's time to go. Um, I just wanted to ask um, Robert because I know there are a lot of people on the call that 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 still live in private homes that might have family, friends, interested parties in your apartment buildings, um, in your senior buildings. And I had a question when you first started. I figured I'd wait. Um, uh, is it affordable housing? Is like market value? Is it? Um, are there wait lists? Like right now, we have three senior buildings in Montclair, and they're all waitlisted. Um, so how right. do you how do you find out more information about your buildings? And it, it, can you even get into them? Yes, you can. To answer your questions, yes, you can get into them. We do have a waiting list at two of our buildings that are subsidized, mm -hmm. which is the neighborhood. Robert, your you're, you're, you're yeah. internet again. In, in Fed Federation Plaza, which is in West, also in Leicester Senior Living, there are openings right now. There are no waiting lists, but they are. We have a few apartments that are Medicaid. And the most of them are all private pay. Yeah, and is it market value, like market rate for the apartments? Like the one in West Orange, the one in South Orange is definitely market rate. The one at Leicester is a little bit more because it's independent living and it's also assisted living. Mm -hmm. It also has a meal plan tied to it. So not only do you have your own apartment, but we do supply certain meals for uh, independent living. You get five meals a week. Okay. So that's Monday to Friday, you get dinner. So that's provided by us through with uh, with your uh, with your monthly rent. They also have activities going on. You know, pre pre COVID, oh, yeah, they activity. had activities going on all the time. Well, pre COVID, we had ten activities a day. So mm -hmm. ten activities or more a day. During COVID, we had at least one to two activities a day before they got where we couldn't get in groups at all. So what we did was we had activities where people opened up their doors to their apartment and they came into the doorway of their apartment and we still held activities that way because our apartments are very big and they're separated throughout the hallway. So we had our event, our event coordinator who handles all those events, did something with each floor of the different residents very well for us during COVID. Mm -hmm. We did something I think was called, uh, it was called, uh, it was called doorway bingo, where everyone opened their doorways 
and we played bingo. They also did a lot of yoga that way and mm -hmm. trivia. They do a lot of trivia. And the only thing that they haven't was able to do was mahjong. That's the only thing they wasn't able to do. So. And I'm, I'm assuming it's open to not just people of the Jewish faith, but anybody. It's both. I like to always say we're multinational. We accept all all everyone from any walks of life the only requirement is they have to be 62 years of age or older okay, okay. so that's the minimum requirement they have to be 62. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right well great info i i didn't know that all those buildings were connected by the same company so interesting yes, um, they're all owned and operated by the jewish community housing corporation but mm -hmm. as I said to you, all of our of life and all of our mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, great information. Thank you so much, Robert. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Randy, for connecting us as always to great programming. Um, and thank you for having me, Michelle. And thank you, you all for having me. Great to, meet you. great to meet you. And thanks, everybody. Um, so if, you're, if you logged in, I have your information. And um, we will ex expect a little uh, holiday treat from, from our friends. Uh, uh -huh. treat, okay. Is it okay if we get it to you on Wednesday? Whenever, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. No, for, I mean for pickup purposes. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, a lot of if people. Not everybody's picking up, so we'll see how it goes. Okay. But there aren't that many people, so. Okay, and if we can help you with the drop off, we'll 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 be happy to do that too. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.